Amen. Amen. All right, here in 1 Corinthians <clears throat> chapter number 9, I want to begin by reading verse number 27, then we're going to read more of the context. Verse number 27 reads, But I keep under my body, this is Paul speaking, but I keep under my body and bring it into subjection. And then he says this, Lest that by any means, when I have preached to others, I myself should be a castaway. The title of the sermon this morning is Self-Discipline in the Christian Life. Self-discipline in the Christian life. Now I want to get the context here because we're going to realize, of course, you may already be familiar with this, that Paul is actually speaking in the context of sports when he talks about having self-discipline. And he's relating it unto having self-discipline in the Christian life. So let's look here at verse number 23. Verse number 23, it says this, And this I do for the gospel's sake, that I might be partaker thereof with you. Verse 24, Know ye not that they which run in a race run all, but one receiveth the prize. So run that ye may obtain, and everyone that striveth for the mastery is temperate in all things. Now they do it to obtain a corruptible crown, but we an incorruptible crown. So of course we can see he's relating this unto sports or athletics. Then he goes on in verse number 26, he says this, speaking about the gospel and likening it unto a race. He says, I therefore so run, talking about the Christian life, not as uncertainly, saying, not like I haven't made my mind up. That's his point. Not as uncertainly, so fight I, not as one that beateth the air. But then he, he finishes with this in verse 27. But I keep under my body and bring it into subjection lest that by any means, when I have preached to others, I myself should be a castaway. So there, in just a few verses, of course, Paul com likens or compares the Christian life unto athletics or unto sports. And I want to begin with one of my first points I want to, uh, uh, you know, uh, seed into your mind right now, is that self-discipline is not exclusively a Christian characteristic. Self-discipline is not an exclusive virtue unto Christians. In order to be successful in any area of life, you must have self-discipline. In order to be successful in any aspect of life or in any area, anywhere, whatever the subject may be, you must have self-discipline. So the principle of self-discipline basically starts when you have an objective. What is an objective? It's like a goal, right? And then you have, of course, some level of determination, however much that may be, that you are going to achieve this objective. And in any mission or, or, or uh, you know, journey to an objective or to a goal, on the way there, you are going to hit obstacles. No matter what it is, there are going to be obstacles there. There are going to be things that stand in your way. Like I said, it doesn't matter what objective or goal we're talking about or what subject it is. There will be opponents in some way or another. What's going to happen is while you're on your way to your goal, there's going to be things that are going to try to prevent you from accomplishing this. And sometimes, sometimes that uh, opponent can be even yourself. Sometimes that obstacle can be yourself, right? It can, you can be giving yourself trouble. Uh, oftentimes, while someone is, is striving for whatever obstacle or whatever, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, or I'm sorry, whatever goal or, or objective that they want to accomplish, they'll start to have second thoughts about it at one point, right? They'll start questioning, you know, whether or not that they even want this, this uh, particular prize, whatever it may be, right? Uh, they'll start questioning, you know, whether or not that they can do it. They'll start, you know, wondering uh, in the sense of, you know, uh, they'll have natural tendencies. Let's say this. We all have the natural tendencies, you know, while on our way to this objective or while on our way to this goal of whether or not we're capable of, comp of accomplishing it. Not only that, we'll have our own lusts that will arise at times, won't we? And that we, we may not even just completely forsake that, but we may want to, you know, go and fulfill these lusts. We may want to go and you know spend time on our own habits or on our own or I'm sorry on our own hobbies or 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 you know maybe spend time on doing things that just makes us happy. And what will we tell ourselves? Hey, I'm just going to put it off for a little while. I'll do it later. I'm still going to accomplish the goal. I'm still going to accomplish the objective, but I'm just going to put off the Christian life. You know, I'm going to just put off church. I'm just going to put off all these things for just a little while, right? That's the type of attitude 
that you would have. A person, in order to have self-discipline, would be someone that is capable or able to silence those internal objections, to silence those internal obstacles or problems that will arise, to, to basically set aside all of those other desires when they arise, because they will arise, to be able to, to subdue those things, to silence you know, uh, the, the, the flesh when it's telling you, hey, you don't need to do this. You know, we can do something else. That would be a person that has self-discipline. A person that is able to continually, continually carry on towards the objective, objective and towards the goal even when other problems, uh, obstacles, and maybe even your own lust will arise. That is the definition of self-discipline. Self-discipline is being able to overcome other desires which are contrary to the mission you are committed to. So we all have many things that we want to do in life, whatever area that it may be. And in order to be successful, in order to succeed in those things, you must have self-discipline. If you don't have self-discipline at all in any area of your life, you will fail in every area of your life. You will eventually fail in every area of your life, unless it's something that just takes one step. And it's just, you just do this and you're done. If it, if it involves any sort of persistence, you will fail in every area of your life if you do not have the virtue or the, the uh, uh, principle uh, in your life of self-discipline. Now, as a Christian, likening this unto Christianity, of course, at the moment we get saved, we receive the Holy Spirit. And, uh, you know, we have a new purpose in life. God has a, a new purpose for us in our Christian life, right? And uh, uh, the, the most important thing to remember is that the flesh is still there. You have the Holy Spirit. God promise us, promises us through His Spirit. He's going to lead us and guide us into all truth. He's there to comfort us. There are many advantages or benefits to having the Holy Spirit. But we cannot forget that the flesh is still there. And that flesh didn't change, didn't transform. It was, it was basically unaffected at the moment that you received the Holy Spirit. Do you understand? It still remained the same. It was untouched. You, just as a person in your core being, you have received. Your spirit and his spirit became one spirit, right? He was, you were, your spirit was given his spirit, right? And it guides your spirit throughout life. But the flesh is still there. So all the same wants, all the same desires, all the same lusts that you had previous to the moment of salvation, previous to receiving the Holy Spirit, is still there. Now, an ideal Christian should have a new ultimate goal in their life. An ideal Christian, their purpose in life should be now what God's purpose is for you in your life. And that is to serve Jesus Christ with every ounce of your body and with every second that you have in this world and in this life. That would be an ideal Christian. And in order for you to be able to live your life for Christ, you must set aside all of your own wants all of your own desires, all of your own lusts, all of those things. You must set those things aside and just spend your time serving Christ and, and the objective needs, needs to be to benefit or to, to uh, um, push forward the kingdom of Christ. I want you to turn to Romans chapter number 7. The objective should be to further the kingdom of Christ. That would be the... Uh, the ideal Christian's attitude. So the recipe for living the perfect Christian life is actually given here in verse number 27 where we were before. I'm going to read it to you one more time. 1 Corinthians chapter 9 verse 27 he said, But I keep under my body and bring it into subjection, lest that by any means when I have preached to others, <clears throat> excuse me, I myself should be a castaway. That right there is the recipe to live a perfect Christian life. Do you know what he says? In the beginning he says, but I keep under my body, and then he says, and bring it into subjection. That's what Paul says. He says he brings his body into subjection. So there's an internal battle or an internal war that goes on with every single Christian. And it's a fight between the flesh and the spirit. And you know what it is? Is this. And this is going to become very relevant here in a few minutes. It's the old man and it's the new man. That's the fight and that's the battle that's going on. It's the old man verse or verses the new man. The wants, the desires, the lusts of the old man, who you were in the past, with or against the lusts, the desires, 
and all of the all, everything that you would want of the new man. The way to live a perfect Christian life is to just subject, to bring your body totally into subjection to the new man. Where the old man would be brought completely and 100% into subjection. The old man is the flesh, the body that we have. But let me say this, Paul, as a Christian, was far from perfect. He was far from perfect. We can read about all the great works that Paul did in his life. And even here when we read this, you know, Paul's able to say, but I keep under my body and bring it into subjection. Lest that by any means when I have preached to others, I myself should be a castaway. It sounds like Paul is just like constantly doing what's right by that statement, right? It's of course a general statement. But we can see that obviously he has this principle of self-discipline in his life. Where he, when he wants something... When his flesh desires something, he's able to step back and to look at the bigger picture and to silence the flesh. He has the desires of the old man of who Paul was before he got saved, the things that he likes, the things that he wants just for himself, things that have nothing to do with Christ, things that have nothing to do with spirituality. Paul had his own interests, but he was able to silence those things and say, hey, I'm going to bring my body into subjection. Even though my body desires these things, even though I want these things, even though I, I, I like these things and I enjoy these things, I'm not giving myself these things because there's, there's a bigger goal. There's something more important in life, right? Well, Paul struggled with these exact same things. Go to, uh, as I said, Romans chapter number 7. Look there with me at Romans 7. We're going to see this in verse number 14. Verse number 14, to begin the sermon this morning in the subject of self-discipline, I want you to understand who you're having to discipline. And as I mentioned, it's the flesh. It's yourself. It's the old man. You're having to discipline yourself. That's why it's self-discipline, right? It's the old man. I want you to look at the nature of the flesh, the nature of the old man. I want you to understand the danger of the old man. And really just who the old man is and the negative capabilities of the old man and of the flesh. Look at verse number 14. It says this. For we know that the law is spiritual. <clears throat> then Paul says this. But I am carnal, sold under sin. So notice how he, de he describes himself here. He says he is carnal. He says, I am carnal. He's saying, I'm fleshly. He says, sold under sin. Look at verse 15. For that which I do, I allow not. For what I would, saying what I want, for what I would, that do I not. But what I hate, that do I. I'm going to walk back through that one more time just to make sure that everyone understood it. Verse 15, he says, for that which I do, I allow not. So he's saying the things that I do in my life, when he says I allow not, he's saying these are things that I, that I wish that I wouldn't do. So actually what he does and the works that he does daily, the things that the decisions that he makes, the things that he commits as a person, he says that in general these are things that he wishes that he wouldn't do. Look at the next part of the verse. <clears throat> For what I would, saying the things that I wish that I would do, what I, what I want to do in my life. For what I would, that do I not. Now think about that for a minute. If we think about self-discipline, right? If we think about self-discipline, I'm sure you have many goals in your life, don't you? As far as the Christian life. You have all these different goals that you've set aside, that, you, that, you've, that you've put up in your mind, that, hey, I want to do this, I want to do that, I want to do this. Well, Paul said he had those too. You know what he says? He says, for what I would, that do I not. So Paul has a certain way that he wants to live his life and certain things that he wants to do in his life, certain things that he wants to get done. He has a person that he wants to be daily. Just an ideal person and goals and objectives of who he wants to be as a person. And he says, for what I would, what he wants, that, I, I'm sorry, what I would, that do I not. Saying that he doesn't meet up to that. But what I hate, the things that he hates, that do I. Verse 16, if then I do that which I would not, so if I do the things that I don't want to do, I consent unto the law that it is good. Saying that that proves that the law is good because I'm not able to meet up to these things. And then keep reading there, verse number 17. Now then it is no more <clears throat> I that do it, but sin that dwelleth in me. And that's of course, he's referring to him being a new man. He's a new creature, right, in Christ. 
For I know that in me, and he elaborates here, that is in my flesh. So when he says in me, he's referring to about the old man there. He says, that is in my flesh dwelleth no good thing. For to will, notice that. That's the desire, isn't it? That's, that's the wants, right? He said, for to will is present with me. So he wants to do what's right. He has the desire to, to live the good Christian life and to do all of these great things. For to will is present with me, but how to perform that which is good I find not. That's a powerful verse right there. So he knows, if you were to ask him, he's not saying, oh, he doesn't even know how to do it. He doesn't even know how to begin to do it. No, he's saying he doesn't know how to overcome the flesh. There's times in his life he's saying, when he, when he, when he makes the statement, but, but how to perform that which is good, I find not. He's saying that there are times in his life when he just, it, he's at a loss and he just can't figure out how to do that which is right. He doesn't know how to overcome that old man. Look at the next verse, verse 19. For the good that I would, I do not. So the good things that he wants to do, he's saying, I don't do. But the evil which I would not, that I do. So the evil things that he doesn't want to do, that's what he does do. Verse 20. Now if I do that I would not, it is no more I that do it, but sin that dwelleth in me. Why is he saying that? He's saying it's no more because he's a new creature. Because he's a new creature because, he's, because he is in Christ. This shows, of course, that that you continue in sin even after you believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. That even after you've put your faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, you are saved, you are sealed unto the day of redemption. You cannot lose your salvation. It's not of works. It's by faith alone. And at that moment, it, you know, as far as your righteousness is in, in the works of the flesh and the way in which you live your life in an outward way, that doesn't just transform and you're just perfect from then on out. No, there's still sin there. That, that old man is still there and he's still exactly the same. The only thing that changed was you were given his righteousness through his Holy Spirit. And he can help you and guide you into all truth, but ultimately it relies upon you making the decisions. You can choose to walk in the Spirit or you can choose to walk in the flesh. Look at what it says in verse... <clears throat> we'll read 21 again. I find that a law that when I do good, evil is present with me. So even at the same moment, you know, when he's doing good, he says, evil is present with him. Why? Because there's, because there, right there you can see uh, the, the coexisting natures of the spirit and the flesh, both at the exact same time, right? Look at verse number 22. For I delight in the law of God after the inward man. Notice that. That's the new creature. But I see another law in my members warring. Notice this internal battle, this fight that's going on. Warring against the law of my mind and bringing me into captivity to the law of sin which is in my members. So who does it sound like in this particular passage does Paul say wins in this battle oftentimes? The flesh. Even for Paul. Even for Paul when he summarizes in general you know, his life and how things go in his life on a daily basis now, of course, there are times when he crucifies the Spirit and in a major way he can do that which is right, of course. But also, there are times when throughout every day, just in general when you look at his life, when he's failing over and over and over again, just on a daily basis, just failing over and over and over again. What's happening? The flesh wins. The flesh wins constantly. Now, this is one thing when you begin and you, and you look at the subject of self-discipline. And you, and you look at your life and you decide, hey, I, I want to be more disciplined. I want to discipline self. I want to tell my body what it's going to do. I'm going to decide where I'm going to go and the goals that I'm going to achieve. What you need to understand is, who is your opponent? You need to understand who you are going to battle with. Now this, <clears throat> in every area of self-discipline or of some type of war battle, or every area of discipline in general, and every fight, if you will, let's say this, every fight or every competition, you need to know who you're fighting against. Let's word it this way. You need to know who you're going up, up to battle against. You know, no one wants to step into a, a ring and have no idea who their opponent is, right? You know what you do is you, you spend months, you know, before you go forth into some sort of like sports or competition type thing. You know what you do? People spend months. They spend, you know, weeks, however long that it is that 
they have to prepare for this competition analyzing their opponent. And they look at their strengths, they look at their weaknesses, they try to figure out who that person is, right? Well, nothing's different here. There's a real war and a real battle that's going on internally. Your flesh is warring, Paul says, against your spirit. And your spirit is warring against your flesh. And there's a real fight going on. And internally, deep down inside, you may want to do what's right, but there's a battle going on between the flesh and the spirit. And the flesh has all of its own wants and desires. And then over here, the spirit has all of its lusts and wants and desires, right? The lust to do what's right. The lust to serve God. You know, people misunderstand the word lust sometimes. Lust just means will or want. That's what the word lust means. So, they both have, you know, their own wants and desires. And there's a battle going on for who is going to win out at the end of the day. What's actually going to take place, you know, in the, in, in the end? Who is going to win out in this, you know, competition or in this fight? And what, what needs to be done is you need to step back. And you need to analyze your flesh. Number one, you need to figure out and understand who the flesh is. And don't underestimate the flesh. Because even Paul, the great apostle that he was, who maybe did the greatest works of any Christian that has ever lived, Paul, when he summarizes his, he, look, he takes a step back and looks at his own flesh and looks at how things work out in his own life, he says that he loses oftentimes. He, he talks about the strength of his flesh and we look at the great things that he does and he, he talks about all the different battles that he loses and how often how the flesh when they war with one another how the, the flesh ends up winning. So we need to understand and not underestimate the strength or the power of our flesh. But not only that we need to understand and we need to learn the different lusts that we personally have, the different wants and desires that the old man has. I want you to turn in your Bible to Galatians chapter number 5, verse number 16. Galatians chapter number 5, verse number 16. <clears throat> so this can show you how important it is to have self-discipline. So if you just had zero self-discipline, who's going to win the fight? There's just no self-discipline. Who's going to win the fight? Well, the flesh is going to just rule. The flesh is going to make every decision. You're going to be walking around just choosing everything that the old man wants to do. Here's the thing. It takes a lot of effort and a lot of work to walk in the Spirit. That's just a fact. Right. It's not like, you know, if, if we look at the two choices, it's not like, oh, you know, if we don't put forth effort, we just, you know, we walk in the Spirit. No, it's the exact opposite. If you don't put forth effort, you walk in the flesh all the time. You actually have to put forth effort to do what's right. You have to actually put forth effort to walk in the Spirit. So when you look at the battle that's going on and you understand the negativity of the flesh and, all of the, all of, and how strong the flesh is, and you look at this fight, it should provoke you or motivate you even more so to understand the effort that you need to put forth. Because if you put forth zero effort, you will be a complete failure in the Christian life. If you have zero self-discipline, self you will ultimately just fail in the Christian life. You will fail in the Christian life. Here in Galatians chapter number 5, I want to look at verse number uh, 16. Verse number 16. It says this, This I say then, walk in the Spirit, and you shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. So notice, number one, there are lusts of the flesh. There are desires of the flesh. And what should we do in order not to? to fulfill those, those lusts. Walk in the Spirit. Notice there's effort that has to be put forth. This first makes zero sense. All these people that believe in like this automatic change that takes place, you get saved and you're just transformed into a new creature and you just do everything of that which is right. Well, Romans 7 makes zero sense. And why are there commandments given to walk in the Spirit? You wouldn't have, Paul wouldn't have to say, hey, walk in the Spirit. He wouldn't have to give any sort of admonition or advice or commandment, right? You would just automatically be doing that. But guess what? There's effort that needs to be put forth. You need to be putting forth effort daily. On a daily basis, you need to be bringing your body or bringing your flesh into subjection to the Spirit. You need to be walking in the Spirit. <clears throat> it says, verse number 16 again, Walk in the Spirit and you shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. Verse 17, for the flesh lusteth, that's like warring, right? Against the spirit and the spirit against the flesh. 
and these are contrary the one to the other. And then watch this, so that you cannot do the things that you would. Doesn't that sound familiar? It's exactly what Paul spoke about in Romans chapter number 7, right? There's a war going on, and the flesh is lusting against the spirit. And I want you to think about that. The flesh, think of the flesh as the opponent. The flesh, your old man, who you were, is actually trying to defeat the new man. And he wants to win out. He wants to make sure that you and your life do not do the things that you should do. He wants to make sure at the end of the day that the new man who is in Christ loses. He wants to make sure that the old man gets his way and he gets every lust and every desire and every want that he has. That's what's going on. There's the flesh and there's the spirit. There's the old man and the new man and there's a fight between the old man and the new man. And the old man has his wants and his desires. And that's what he wants for that day. That's what he wants for that moment. But then there's the new man. And he has all of these wants and these desires, right? He wants to do what's right. He wants to walk in the law of the Lord. He wants to read his Bible. He wants to go to church. He wants to do things that are holy and righteous and peaceful and to bring you know, true joy, righteous joy. And the old man wants to make sure that that does not happen. Look at what it says next, verse 18. But if you be led of the Spirit, you are not under the law. Now watch this, verse 19. Now the works of the flesh are manifest, which are these. Adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lasciviousness, <coughs> excuse me, idolatry, witchcraft, hatred, variance, emulations, wrath, strife, seditions, heresies, envyings, murders, drunkenness, revelings, and such like. And then it goes on, <clears throat> um, of the which I tell you before, as I, as I have also told you in time past, that they which do such things shall not inherit the kingdom of God. And then verse 22, but the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance. And then he says, against such there is no law. So notice how these two things are totally opposite of one another. So you have the old man, right? And he, he desires and he wants all of these things on this list. So, you know, in general, our sinful nature has basically all of the same lusts and desires. Certain people will have more of, of, of an inclination towards certain sins. Uh, maybe depending on what they've been exposed to in their life or what, what, whatever their past maybe uh, you know, has indulged in. If there's a certain sin that you've spent a lot of time in in the past, well, in your mind, of course, you're going to lust for that. In your mind, of course, you may have trouble you know, subduing that thought, whatever it may be, right? And, and another person may have different you know, proclivities or different inclinations, right? Or, or, or more of, uh, of a proclivity towards another sin, right? But in general, the sins that are on this list are the same sins that, that, that you desire. Paul, this is the lust of the flesh for the general man. Some things you may have never really got into, right? But in general, these are the lusts of the old man, right? This is what the old man desires. And we need to look at the old man and we need to understand the, the, the negative power that the old man has and really the type of filth that he wants to, and think about it like this, that he wants to get you into and the way that he wants your life to end up. And then we need to look at the other side and look at the spirit and look at the things that that we could obtain to and the things that the Spirit desires, right? The fruits of the Spirit. We need to understand the, the polar you know, uh, opposition between these two things. I want you to turn to Romans chapter number 6, verse number 6. Romans chapter number 6, verse number 6. So you need to step back and understand the, the polar opposite between these two. You need to know what the old man likes you need to know what's right for the new man, right? You need to read the Word of God. You need to know all the, all the ways in which to walk in the Spirit. You need to know the law of God. All of that, right? You need to know your own self. You need to know your own lusts and your own desires and your own wants. 
You need to step back and you need to analyze, if you will, or evaluate the old man. Look at yourself in honesty and look at all of the sins that you maybe have you know, inclinations towards. Look at all the times where you have you know, uh, points in your life where you've failed. Maybe even after you, you, you've, you've started the, the, the race. You've began the race in the Christian life. Where are the times in your life where you just went downhill? Where you started failing in the Christian life? Where, where were you and what brought this about? What particular lust did you go after and what was causing you to not get done what you should have been getting done. Now, everyone here, and I, I kind of alluded to this just the other night and Wednesday night. Everyone here, you know, obviously you're not out of church. Obviously you're not, I, you know, I don't know every deep, dark, you know, uh, sin in everyone's life in the entire world. So I wouldn't be able to tell you, you know, if you have something, you know, in your closet. I wouldn't know that. But I would go ahead and, and, and you know, uh, charity believeth all things. So I believe all you people are pretty good people, right? I believe that you're living a good Christian life in general. You're coming to church every week. You're reading your Bible at least on a regular basis, right? So you can look at your Christian life and I'm sure you still have goals and objectives that you want for yourself, right? I'm sure next year you don't want to be at the same place where you are today. I'm sure you want to be further you know, in the Christian race. You want to be bigger and, 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 and stronger as a Christian next year or in five years or in ten years or in twenty years, right? And you have certain objectives and certain goals. Well, you're going to have an opponent. There's going to be somebody you're fighting against. You know what it's going to be? Yourself. It's going to be the old man. Now, you have an advantage against the old man. Do you know why? Because you know him super well. I want you to think about that. See, I don't know, you know Brother Elliot's old man that well. I don't know Brother Russell's old man, Brother Anthony's old man that well, right? You know, I don't, I don't know Brother Hall, anyone in here. I don't know anyone's old man that well. You know, and I don't want to get to know him, okay? But I know my old man very well, right? I know him better than anyone could possibly know him. I know everything, every area, and every flaw that I have, right? And, you know, obviously some people have trouble kind of looking at themselves and seeing their own problems, but so maybe that's an area where you need to work on figuring out where your, where your, uh, uh, you know, your, your issues are. But I know my own problems, and I know what, can, what my tendencies are and the things that I would, you know, all, all, the, all of the lusts of the flesh, I know where it's possible that, hey, I, I might fall into that. Or I know that, hey, this is something that I desire. That's not necessarily that, something that interests me. But this may be an area where that may cause me to stumble, right? So I have this major advantage when I'm fighting, when the new man is fighting the old man. So I, I know all of the problem. I know all of his, his strengths and his weaknesses. So I have this huge advantage when I'm stepping forth into this fight, don't I? So you know what I need to do is, I need to use that to my own advantage. I need to, and, and, a, and a great example of this, and I spoke about this a little bit Wednesday night, is I need to not put myself in a position where I'm setting myself up for sin. Amen. I need to not make provisions for the flesh. Now, if you know that you have a struggle in a certain area, and I'll give you an example. Let's just talk about reading the Bible, because that's just super important. If you know that you struggle getting your Bible reading done in a certain way, let's say some people know, hey, I'm not good at reading the Bible, you know, um, let's say at the end of the day. You know what you need to do? You need to read the Bible at the beginning of the day. You need to get the, your Bible reading done in the beginning of the day. You need to do it first thing. If you, let's say that you come home and you're not necessarily lazy. You like, like to do a lot of work or something, right? And you know that you have a lot of stuff that you need to get done at the house. You know, then you need to make sure before you get there, you need to make sure that you get your Bible reading done. You need to know what type of person that the old man is. You need to know like, hey, I struggle with prayer if I don't do it at this time. Or hey, I start to backslide when I watch, you know, this particular, whatever it may be. Like even sports for myself, obviously I grew up in sports, so I don't spend a lot of time watching sports at all. I just won't spend a lot of time watching sports just because I know how I, I literally like, will like almost refuse to watch sports for like the first five years. I had like a prohibition on sports in my life, literally, for like the first five years when I got into the Christian life. Do you know why? Because I understood the old man. 
And I understood that that's where it'll start and then it could go downhill fast from there. I just start watching sports. I start maybe, then I want to go start playing basketball all the time. And then you know what happens is I just start consuming my life with sports and vanity as opposed to the things of God. See, it, can, it, you know, it doesn't have to be something that you think of just like, oh, you know, I'm going to be out at the bar, right? That was why I, I started a moment ago with, you know, I'm speaking to what I believe to be Christian people, right? People that are coming to church, they're living the Christian life. So my struggles at this point in my maturity of my Christian life are not the same. You know, I don't, I don't necessarily struggle, I don't struggle with thinking like, hey, I'm going to go do some drugs or go drink. That's not a problem that I have, right? But, you know, one thing that I could fall into as my old man is, is maybe just wanting to watch sports all the time. So, you know, like on Facebook, if I, if I go to the, the TV section, I'm giving you a personal example here. You know, they have the TV section. I hide all from NBA. I, I'm giving you a real example of my life. I go on there because they, they start to pop up because, hey, they, they like have algorithms where they'll, they'll see what you watch for long periods of time, right? So if I catch myself starting to watch those and they're, they're flipping up there all the time, I notice a section, ESPN or whatever it may be, I go to pop, hide all, bam, shut down, old man. You get what I'm saying, obviously. And I don't give myself the opportunity just to fall into this all the time. Because you know what can happen is you'll spend an hour or two hours of your time when you're supposed to be reading your Bible watching NBA TV. That's what you'll do. And I'm not saying, hey, you might be watching some sort of like filth, like pornography or something. You know, I'm saying you can struggle with the old man in other ways. And if that's an issue with you and, you know, videos are popping up, you know, you need to go to hide all in those other videos. Obviously, you need to do that anyways, right? But anything, there's even a possibility of a struggle for you in your life. You need to, this is the point, you need to put it out of reach, you need to set it somewhere. Like I was talking about Wednesday night, you need to hide it, you know, under the tree in Shechem. You need to get it away from you. You need to put yourself in a position where the old man can't rise up, you know, where he can't be stimulated to come up and, and, and want to play basketball, right? Or do whatever in your life, whatever it is that you struggle with. <clears throat> you need to understand the old man. You need to know his weaknesses and what he wants and how he can beat you. Because the old man, there is, there is a fight inside of you and there is that old man inside of you that wants to destroy the new man. He wants the new man to lose. The old man would love to take you back to exactly where he was before. He would love to have you doing the same things and living the same life that you were living in the past. That's what he wants. He wants all of the negative, all of the sinful lusts and desires that you have deep down, that you had before. He wants to get back to that same stage where he's just indulging and splurging in that. And if you were to be honest, you would, you would admit that you know that. Right. That there's a part of you that will rise up every once in a while and you're like, where did that come from? Yeah. That's just the truth. And you know what happens is the less you walk in the Spirit, the more you walk in the flesh. And the more that flesh just daily in your life starts to rise up. That's why it's like this. It's uphill and downhill. Walking in the Spirit and then walking in the flesh. Walking in the Spirit and then walking in the flesh. So you know what you need? You need to analyze your opponent. And it's you. You need to analyze, hey, what are my flaws? And like I said, you have an advantage. You know, every, you, you know more than anything the things that you struggle with. You know when you put yourself in this situation, I fail every single time. Well, in order to have self-discipline, you know what you need to do? Beforehand, you need to say, this is, I'm going to discipline myself. This is the decision I'm going to make. I'm not going there. I'm not doing that. I'm not going to allow that. Hey, if you've got to get rid of your cell phone, you do what you have to do. Whatever it may be. If you have to get rid of a laptop, if you have to, whatever it is. If you have to make sure that you read your Bible, whatever, first thing every morning, whatever it is. If you struggle with laziness and getting up at a certain time or going to work or whatever it may be, then you need to make you know, provisions or you need to make preparations to make sure that that stops. You need to figure out yourself. You need to figure out yourself, your own problems, and, and you need to understand how to defeat yourself. You know, Brother Russell and I were actually talking about this a few months ago. I've been thinking about preaching about this for a while. About how, how, how to actually understand, you know, who you are and how to win out. You know, I have ways mentally where I can just overcome myself in my own mind. I know it's the old man. I know the things that will motivate me. 
There are certain things I know that will shut the flesh up. And there are certain things that will cause the, me to walk in the Spirit more. I know the times when I feel like, hey, I'm not going to do anything right now. I know what to say to myself. And to, and to get myself like, hey, you need to do this. You need to do that. You need to, you know, get, yeah, if you do that, this is what will happen. You know what I'm doing? I'm trash talking the old man. Seriously. That's what, it's a real fight between old man, new man. It's almost like a person-to-person -person battle. Where there's this personality, there's this personality, and it's a real war and a struggle between two people. So you need to figure yourself out. You need to evaluate yourself and learn how to overcome the old man. You need to learn how to take the old man down. I'll tell you a funny, a funny, uh, 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 it's not a joke, it's a real story. It's a funny story. My pastor, uh, uh, when I really was serving God for many years, you know, uh, like five years or so back in, in uh, northern Kentucky, he, uh, he had a guy that, that he listened to online and stuff, and he, tra he trained under for a period of time, would go down. This guy was in North Carolina area, and he would go down there and go to his church oftentimes. And uh, I can't remember the guy's name, but he told me a story about how this guy, he, this guy supposedly struggled with lying. So he told me a story about, about how this guy got himself to stop lying. This is, this is a perfect practical example for you. And this is extreme, but it's, it's practical. He said that every time that he would lie to someone, he got to the point where he would tell them that he was lying to them. So he would like say it to the person, like the lie, and then he's like, I'm sorry, I just lied to you. Immediately afterwards. And he said, you know what happened was I started embarrassing that old man. And he said that old man stopped wanting to lie so much. He started shutting that old man up. He said, hey, he said, he said, I don't recommend this. This is what the guy said. I can't remember his name. Dave something. Uh, my pastor's name is Dave, but this guy's name I think was Dave as well. But he said, he said that, uh, I, I don't recommend this. He said, but it worked like a charm. He said it took weeks and all of a sudden he just stopped lying to people. He, because, you know, oftentimes you lie because, hey, you don't want to go there, you want to do this. It's, it's another way, basically, to get around of what you want, right? So he, it, what it did was also, in turn to that, secondary positive from that was it caused him to start doing better, more things in his life that he should be doing. Because he was lying because he didn't want to do that, he didn't want to go there, maybe he wasn't doing his job well enough, so then it just caused him, hey... I'm going to have to do what I said I was going to do now instead of just lying to get my way out of it. That's a perfect example. You know, start telling people, hey, I just, I just lied to you just now a moment ago. I bet you'll stop lying. You know what you need to do? You need to do whatever you... That's how important it is. That's how important it is to win out against the old man. If you have, no, let, if you have zero self-discipline, you will be a total and complete failure in the Christian life. You have to get to the point where you, in the Spirit, decide what you are going to do in the Christian life. This is, I'm going to read my Bible at this time. I'm going to read my Bible, I'm going to read this amount of my Bible. I'm going to pray at these times and I'm going to pray this amount of, this amount of time in my life. I, by this point, am going to have this amount of Bible reading done. And you never allow, because there's going to be obstacles and there's going to be times in your life where the old man's like, hey, why don't you just go do this? Do you know what you need to do? Paul said, I keep under my body and I put it into subjection. You need to put that old man into subjection. You need to shut that old man up in whatever way. See, it's going to be different for me than it is for you. The thought for me that I always use is I don't want to waste my life. And I think about, and this is just what works for me. When I start to get, you know, where I feel like I can feel the old man, I start thinking about where am I going to be and that's why you'll hear me preach that oftentimes. It's something I relate to. I start thinking about, hey, I'm just going to do this. You know, I'm just going to do this. I know what works for me. And then you know what I start thinking immediately? If, you, if I did that every single time, where would you be at next year? Where are you going to be at in a year? Look at what you're doing. You happy with where you are now? Don't you want to do more in your life? Those types of thoughts, they motivate me. And I mean not just the statement, the real thought of where, where is this church going to be in 10 years? Where am I going to be at in my Christian life in 5 years? How, my growth? How many more times am I going to read my Bible? Is this how I'm going to get there? By doing this every time? If I succumb to this every single time? That's what works for me. So you know what you need to do? You need to figure out the new man 
needs to look at the old man and figure out all the problems that the old man has, all of, the, all of the ways in which the old man tries to creep in, the strategies and the deceits and the things that the old man likes and lusts after and the ways he tries to get what he wants. And the new man has to defeat the old man that way. You have the greatest advantage in the world because nobody can know that old man better than you know him. You know what I mean? Brother Anthony's new man knows the old man better than anybody could. There's no one, his wife, anyone, no one knows the old man as good as, as, as the new man. This is where self-discipline comes in. You know, like Paul said, it's a super big struggle. And that shows you the importance. Like Paul said, how to perform that which I would, I find not. Think about that. That tells you how difficult it actually is to have self-discipline and to put that old man into subjection. Where did I have you turn Romans 6? 6? <clears throat> Get there myself. Romans chapter number 6, verse number 6. Talks about this, the old man here. Uh, chapter number 6, verse number 6, we're going to run through a few of these. Knowing this, that our old man is crucified with him, that the body of sin might be destroyed. That henceforth... We should not serve sin. Go to Ephesians chapter number 4. That's why, of course, he's called the old man is because he's put to death with Christ. He's buried with Christ. Ephesians chapter number 4. I mean, you need to think about, he is your enemy. He's not your friend. The old man, he's your enemy. He wants what's bad for you. He desires what's bad for you. He desires the things that are going to damage you and they're going to hurt you and they're going to cause you to not succeed in the Christian life. Think about that. That's who the old man is. You know, that, you know what had to happen to him? He had to be killed and he had to be put to death. That's how bad he is. Think about how, you know, the, uh, uh, just how powerful he is in a day-to-day -day basis of how often you lose out, like Paul talked about. So that right there should put you on the alert. That should help you understand the seriousness of this. Look at Ephesians chapter number 4, verse number 22. It says that you put off concerning the former conversation the old man, which is corrupt according to the deceitful lust. Notice that. What is the old man? He's corrupt. According to what? Deceitful lust. That's your old man. That's who your old man is. Go to Colossians chapter number 3. Colossians chapter number 3, we'll see this again. <clears throat> Colossians chapter number 3, I think it's yeah, verse number 9. <clears throat> Look at, uh, actually we'll read previous to that. Uh, verse 6, For which things sake the wrath of God cometh on the children of disobedience, in the which ye also walked some time, when ye lived in them, but now ye also put off all these. This is referring to the flesh. Anger, wrath, malice, blasphemy, filthy communication out of your mouth. Lie not one to another. And then he says this. Seeing that ye have put off the old man with his deeds. Notice how he refers to him with his deeds. Like what? Like it's this other person that you're battling against. Because it's almost like an, uh, uh, you know, a, a person-to-person -person fight. It truly is. Because you know who the new man is? It's you in Christ. You know who the old man is? It's you in your sin and in your filth and just in your flesh. Go to... Uh, I'm have you, we're going we're gonna to go ahead and conclude. Go to 1 Corinthians chapter 15. 1 Corinthians chapter number 15. I'm going to read to you from Galatians chapter number 5, verse number 24, what we were reading before. It said this after it spoke of the war between the, the flesh and the spirit, it says in verse 24 of Galatians 5, And they that are Christ have crucified the flesh with the affections and lusts. Then it says this in verse 25, If we live in the spirit, let us also walk in the spirit. So 1 Corinthians chapter number 15. So the Bible talks about oftentimes about you know, picking up our cross. I didn't include any of those verses, but it talks about picking up our cross. And that's what it's talking about. It's, it's talking about setting aside the things that we want. When Christ came to this earth, obviously He was a perfect man. 100% sinless, and He did always that which is right. And the cross is the perfect symbol of 
him just setting aside anything that he would have wanted or anything outside of that and just doing exactly what the will of God was. And that's what that would symbolize in our life. When, when Christ talks about, hey, pick up your cross. Anyone who wants to follow me, they must you know, uh, forsake self is what he's saying. And pick up their cross and then follow me. What is he saying? He's saying you, you have to leave yourself behind. All of all, that old man, you have to totally, what do you got to do? You have to put him, put him to death, basically, right? Completely, you have to crucify him. The Bible talks about mortifying the flesh. You have to put it aside, all of the wants, the desires, the lust that the old man has, all of those things, set those things aside and pick up the cross and do the will of God. And it's hard. It's difficult. You know, carrying the cross is not easy. Doing what God has for you in your life is not easy. And hey, you're never going to be perfect. You're never daily on a daily basis going to always do it all in thought, deed, everything. You're never going to do everything what's right. But you need to start developing self-discipline. Because you can have different layers or different levels, let me say, of self-discipline. There's different, there's different uh, uh, phases of maturity in, in, in your Christian walk. And we need to push towards that new man, which is Christ. We need to push towards that perfect man. And we need to, in order to do that, you're going to have to continually develop more and more self-discipline. Because you know what? On a daily basis, you have to shut up the flesh and walk in the Spirit. So you know what you have to do? You have to learn self-discipline on a daily basis. More and more and more. And the Spirit has to get stronger and stronger and stronger. And you have to start exerting self-discipline more and more and more. Every day. Just as the day goes on. It, the, the flesh is never going to totally go away until death. He'll be there until death. And he'll always, even as an old man, be trying to you know, put a fight up with the spirit. Until the day of death, right? You know, I wanted it to be like an old man. That's why I did that. <laughs> right? I didn't know if everybody got that joke. But yeah. So it, it's never going to go away. He's never just, oh, now I'm old, you know, or now I'm at this phase of my Christian life. He's not changing. He's the same. That's the point. He will always be there and the, and the lust of the flesh will always be there. So you know what you have to do? You have to start exerting self-discipline. And if you don't, your Christian walk will stop right there. You may keep coming to church and all that, but you're not going to, you're, you're basically just stopping on the road. And you're just sitting right there in your Christian life. And you're not going forward. You're not growing. And in order to grow, you must have self-discipline. You know what you have to do? You have to keep under your body. You need to be your own boss. You need to be strong enough to shut up the old man. The new man needs to be strong. You need to be a strong enough Christian where you tell the old man what you're going to do. You better just sit down for the day, buddy. You ain't getting, you're not getting your way today. Seriously. You need to have that attitude where it's a fight and you understand what he wants. Think about, think about what the old man wants to do to you. This is how you need to view it. Right? I love the way that that's worded when, after he says, after uh, the example where the guy tells him, hey, I just lied to you. And then he says, you know what you'll do is you'll embarrass that old man. Because it's, it's like this battle between two people. And it is. It really is. That's how you need to view it. Like he's your enemy. And I'm going to defeat him. He's not me. He says, that is in me, that is in my flesh, dwelleth no good thing. And then Paul goes on to start talking about himself, and then he's like distinct from the flesh, like another person in the flesh. And he's like, he, his, right? Put off the old man and his conversation. There's a fight, a real fight. And somebody's going to win, the spirit and the flesh. You need to put him into subjection. You need to be the boss. You need to discipline him. You need to discipline the self. The, 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 uh, the flesh. You need to win the battle. 1 Corinthians 15, look at verse number 31. It says this, I protest by your rejoicing. And this, which, well, this is what you have to do, which I have in Christ Jesus our Lord. And then he says, I die daily. Dying is, uh, and it's, it's, it's a little tiny bit out of context, but let me, I want to word it this way because it ties in with, you know, carrying your cross. It's not fun. This is what I want to end on. It's not fun, and it's not fun for anyone, right? Doing what's right all the time and getting up out of bed in the morning early and picking up your Bible 
It's not fun for, for, there's no one that you can look at and say, every time I pick up my Bible, you know, you know, excuse the crudeness, I have rainbows flying out of my butt. No. You know, you're not happy about it every single time. You don't feel like doing it every single time. Every time you get down to pray, you're not going to do, want to do it. Sometimes it's like dying. You know what's going on is the, the flesh is dying. He's like, mm, I'm not getting my way. That's how it feels. It feels like you're losing. But you know what's happening is the flesh is actually dying. It's good. You know, what you need to think is, I'm glad you're mad, buddy. I'm glad you're mad. You need to understand that there are going to be times when you have to do what's right and you don't want to and you do it anyways. Amen. You know, you're, there's going to be times when you have something that you have to get done spiritually. Let's say you have to read your Bible and you're like, I'm not reading my Bible today. I'm just going to sleep a little longer because I stayed up late last night. Too stinking bad. Put the flesh to death. Amen. Die daily. It's a continual fight. It's never going to go away. He says, I die daily. What's he saying? Every day. It didn't change. Every single day. Did he say, well, you know, the past two days I didn't have to crucify the flesh because I was so strong in the spirit. I just, it carried me through for two whole days. No. Every little bit, every few minutes, he's going to try to pop up. Mortify the flesh. It's not fun every time. Hey, sometimes if you're walking in the Spirit, you're going to say, Hey, I want to read my Bible. I can't wait to read my Bible. I've been thinking about this passage. I want to open up my Bible and I want to read about it. But you know what? It's not like that every time. It's not like that every time. Coming to church is not exciting every single time. You're not going to be just excited every time you walk through the threshold of that door. It's not going to happen. When you're singing hymns, you know what? Sometimes it's not exciting. It may not be your favorite song, whatever the reason might be. But you know what? The f you need to put the flesh to death. The spirit needs to win. You know, you know why it's not fun? Because that's, you're being the old man right now. You know what you've done? Is you've stepped over there where the old man is. And he won. It's basically like this. You have, think, of, think of it in this way. Well, think of it, you have basically like a two, per two persons with their minds. and with, This is going to be like the Trinity, right? You have two persons here. You have the old man, like he's, you know, has his wills, his wants, his desires, right? A living, functioning being. Think of it that way. Then you have the new man, living, functioning being, and he wants to do what's right in his life. He wants to serve God. He deep down wants to do what's right and be a great Christian and please God. This guy over here has no interest. He wants to do what he wants to do. He wants to do just sinful things. All of these desires and fleshly lusts that we read about in Galatians 5, that's what he wants. And you know your personal lusts and desires and the things that you want to do in your life and the vanity that you want to consume your mind with and your life and all those things. The filth of whatever it may be. Movies, whatever it may be. That, that's what this guy wants, right? And then you have like this third person. This can be the son. No, I'm just kidding. You have like this, this other guy here. This is you and your spirit, right? And, so, and the flesh is like trying to grab the spirit and get him to walk in him. And, the spirit, and, the, and then over here, the new man, he's trying to grab the spirit who is you and get him to walk in him. And there's like this real fight that's going on where this guy wants to win and that guy wants to win. And when you, when you fall and you succumb to this, you know what happens is? It's sad to think about. The, the flesh grabs you, who you are, your spirit, and wins. And he's like, we're doing what I want to do today. You just go do whatever, you know, whatever it is. You know, different levels of sin and different areas of, 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 different stages of the Christian life. It may not be going to bars and drinking and being a, a complete and absolute fool. But you know what it may be? A day consumed with vanity on the computer doing stupidity and not reading your Bible and not praying and thinking about filth, whatever it may be. Watching, you know, filthy comedy, whatever it may be. Right? He wins for the day. Isn't that, isn't that uh, you know, defeating to think about? Isn't that a, a negative thought? Isn't that a negative thought to you? I would hate that. Who wants to live a, a life like that? If that doesn't bother you, then you have no real ambition to, to be a, a strong Christian in your life. But then there are certain days where the Spirit wins, where He grabs that man and He says, we're going to do what's right today. 
You wake up, you read your Bible, you go to work, you work as hard as you can, you, you, your mind is just on the things of God, you're listening to the Bible, you're memorizing Scripture, you're just meditating on the Word of God, you're thinking about the Bible, you're joyful, you're peaceful, you're walking in the Spirit, you get home, you pray with your family, right? You eat your food, you say, hey, I want to read some more Bible. You, you're just thinking about God's Word. You're doing what's right daily. You're keeping God's commandments. You're living joyful. You're teaching your children the Bible when you get home. Your mind and in everything, you're just praising and serving God daily. At night, you, you pray again. You just live a joyful, happy life in the Lord. Right? Isn't that what you want to do every day? And just be a better Christian. You learn things from the Bible. You're thinking about these new things that you've learned. You've, you, you, you completed the day just at a higher level than you've ever completed it. Think about that. You know, I was you know, just being a strong Christian. Where maybe you had a struggle and you're like, no way. Not happening, right? Isn't that who you want to be as a Christian? Isn't that who you want to be as a Christian? Well, there's this real fight going on. And you, and you know who decides who's going to win? This guy in the center. He can go wherever he wants to go. He can go over here and walk with this guy if he wants. He can go over here and walk with this guy. That's self-discipline. You know what? Everybody, here's the thing. Everybody struggles with doing what's right. Everyone, even Paul. That's why we started out with that. Even Paul, who said, I keep under my body and put it into subjection. You know what else he said? said, the things that I, the things that I would, uh, uh, he talks about how to perform the things that I would, he said, I find not. He had times where he walked in that old man, Saul, if you will. Saul and Paul, that's perfect. He had times where he walked in that old man. He did. Do you know who decided who was going to win? The guy in the middle. He chooses where he's going to go. It's self-discipline. You know, and this is also a quick tip. In, in observation, I've learned, because you can learn discipline in different areas of life. And, and there are certain qualities that can carry over into the Christian life that you can, you can get elsewhere, right? Uh, a person can, can learn a ton of Bible and not be saved, and they could still use that to help them after they get saved, right? Memorizing scripture and things like that, like Paul. You think Paul had to just go back and, and just re-memorize all the Bible? No, he knew it. He just had, at that point, he'd have a new understanding. He had a benefit, right? He, he would go back and then it would make more sense to him. Right? You can have, here's a perfect example. You can have Christian virtues. There are a lot of people, men, let's say, that, that are, you know, dedicated to their wives and that they would not ever, you know, do, commit any sort of unfaithfulness to their wife. And they have morals. There are plenty of families out there that have great morals and they're just not saved. If they were to get saved, these are already virtues that, they would, that would help them and benefit them. You can get disciplined without Christianity and you can help that to carry over into other areas of life. Right? So even if you're not saved, a person can have discipline and it can help. And that can just help them when they get saved. That they already have that. And they can apply it in walking in the spirit and the flesh. In, 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 in this sense, this is what it is beforehand. When it's just the flesh... You have all, all, basically what it is is you just have all these fleshly desires, right? And you're just choosing where you're going to go and what you're not going to do. And you have fleshly motives and, and self goals. Do you understand what I'm saying? And you're just saying, hey, I want this. I want to be, a, you know, an NBA star. So I'm not going to spend my time on this. So you can have discipline in that area, right? But when it comes to the Christian life, it's, it's a whole new battle. It's right versus wrong. It's good versus evil. You understand? And you have to decide whether you're going to do right and wrong, good and evil. And you know what you need to do? You've got to discipline yourself. And I'll tell you somewhere where, where people can learn discipline uh, or self-discipline. Self-discipline comes from being disciplined. So a person that, if you look at people that grow up that were not disciplined and had no boundaries, they do not know how to... Um, you know, a practice self-discipline in their lives. They have no idea how to practice self-discipline because they were never forced to, to be disciplined themselves. 
So by disciplining your children, you are teaching them there are things you can do and things you cannot do. There are boundaries, places you can't go. There, you know, there are all these different things. There needs to be lines drawn and these things are off limits. So it's good, obviously, to discipline our ch children and it teaches them to be self-disciplined, to have self-discipline when they grow up. They realize I can't just do everything when I want to do it. They understand there are times when I desire to have a cookie and I can't have it. So when they get older, a person that's just like, have a cookie, have a cookie, have a cookie. What do you think they're going to do when they grow up? Nah, 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 right? They're just going to eat because they, they don't understand. Hey, you have to be disciplined. You have to have discipline, right? So we need to teach our children the importance of discipline, of self-discipline. And when they grow up, they can have this characteristic. It's a Christian characteristic. The world can, can anything that they, see there's a right way and a wrong way to do things. And sometimes the world figures out, hey, in order to be successful in this area, like sports, I need to be a hard worker. Well, that's a Christian characteristic. It comes from God, right? So we need to practice self-discipline. It is, it's a Christian characteristic. It's what God has for us. And in order to be a successful Christian, you have to put the flesh in check. The, the new man, make sure that the new man wins and put the old man to death. Let's bow our heads and have a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, God, we thank you, dear Lord, for this day. We thank you, dear God, for the